Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception, and we're back with part three of this brief series on Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. There were some things we needed to define first. Part one was the kingdom of God. Part two is life and death that I'm going to talk about today. Now, all of this, looking at the kingdom of God and, and all that this teaches us, looking here at life and death, we have done all of this in order to rightly understand what is being taught here in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. We need to study there is a vast difference between studying the Word of God and reading the Bible. We need to study. We need to go deep. Because when we do that, deeper meaning comes to us. And we can be like the noble Bereans that Paul talks about in the book of Acts, who searched the scriptures daily to see if these things, what Paul was teaching him, to see if these things were so. And I talk about these things all the time. Context, making sure things are coherent, that what we're saying here agrees with what's being said over there. All of these things are of great importance to understanding the Word of God. And a big part of it is so that we're not misled. It's easy to be misled. The Bereans weren't going to be misled because they were in the Word and they were staying in the Word. They were checking what Paul was telling them with their copies of the Old Testament. Now, one more thing needs to be discussed here in order to rightly understand these three relatively, each one of the verses is fairly long, but it's only three verses of Scripture, and that is the thousand years. Now, if you want a good grasp on the thousand years and what it's about, you can go watch this video entitled Questions About the Millennium. It's in the playlist for Revelation. You can always find my Revelation videos by going, or any of my videos by going to my website, decodingthedeception.com, Bible, and then pick the book, and the playlist is right there. That's probably the easiest way to get to it. There are also other resources on that Revelation tab to help you understand the book. But the thousand years, I'm not going to go over it all again, but the thousand years is part of Christ ruling in his kingdom, that that is tied to that concept of the kingdom of God coming through his word. And what we saw in this section was that the thousand years is the reign of Christ's church in this world. That's the thousand years. Christ ruling in our hearts through his word here in this life. And it carries over into heaven as well. It's not something to wait for a thousand years in an earthly kingdom as though what Jesus said to Pontius was, well, he was having a bad day. He'd been whipped and he misspoke. No, his kingdom is not from here. It's all tied to his word, the proclamation of his word and the spread of his word. And it's tied to this guy, Satan. That's the way he's depicted in this picture, being bound See what's all around him? Bibles with glowing crosses above it and a chain. He's bound by the word. It limits his power and what he can do. Now, let's get into this section of our text for today. And I saw thrones. And they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads and their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. A thousand years. It keeps coming up again and again. That's why it's so important to understand it. Now, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. What does that statement bring to mind? I think that it brings to mind Daniel and Daniel 7. We'll go there in just a minute. One thing I want to make sure and say, in understanding the word, we need to ask important questions, important questions like, who wrote it? To whom did they write it? What was it about? You know, what was the what was the setting? Why was it written? We forget this about the book of Revelation because we get into all these fantastic visions and we're going, wow, this is amazing stuff. And we get down into the weeds and into the details. Not that I fall prey to that. It's a good thing. But we do that and we forget this letter was written by the apostle John as he was exiled on the island of Patmos and was sitting there 92 years old on a rock and God was showing him these things and he was writing them down for the believers in seven churches. The seven letters to the seven churches. Well, the whole thing is still addressed to them. Remember, whether it's the book of Exodus, the book of Isaiah, or the book of Revelation, it is written for us. It is not written to us. If I find a letter that my grandfather wrote home from war to my dad, my grandfather was in World War II, that he wrote from the battlefields of Belgium and wrote to my dad and read it as though it was written to me, I'd think, wow, that's kind of weird. Why is grandpa talking to me that way? I can understand it better if I know, oh, this is from Captain Joseph Smith, physician in a field hospital, to his children, Kincaid, David, and Samantha, or Nancy, sorry, Nancy, got my aunt wrong, wrong aunt. Then I can understand, okay, that's why it's written. It's during a war. It's written in 1944. All of these things matter. So this was written to churches who were undergoing persecution. Their own, in many instances, had been beheaded in front of them or hauled into prison or beaten or persecuted financially. Do you think they felt victorious? Do you think they were inclined to think of themselves as part of the kingdom of God? Do you think they thought of themselves as ruling and reigning with Christ? No. They saw heads come off and roll in the sand, and that sand absorbed their blood as it flowed out. That's the setting. So we need to understand by whom and to whom and when and why this letter was written them to them. And what and it's for us. Elsewise, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have made sure to preserve it for two thousand years. It's for us. We learn from it, but I've got to work to understand the setting, the context, the way they looked at things, the way they use terms. All of that is important. They felt on the verge of defeat. They felt like they were hanging on to a ledge by their fingernails with one hand. And the theme of the book, Jesus always wins. I don't say it often enough. The theme of the book of Revelation is Jesus always wins. It doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter what's happening. It doesn't matter if you're the one with your head on the chopping block. Jesus always wins, and nothing is as it appears. Do you see how important these things are? Understanding the kingdom, what real life is. Your life is hidden with God in Christ, in heaven. Big things at play here. But he starts out with a statement of what he sees. And John didn't think this stuff up. He saw it. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. He saw thrones. We have to think of Daniel. Daniel, in that place where who appears? Let's go to it. And I watched, and thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. God's counsel in the heavens. And then 
what happens? The court was seated, and I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before them. This is a picture of God's counsel, victory. Jesus as the cloud rider, the Son of Man, his favorite title for himself. All of these things are brought to mind. Why? Because these people knew their Old Testament, and they knew the book of Daniel, and they knew what this meant. We need to know it. You need to know it. I need to know it. And they sat on them. We're going to talk about who they and them are. In conspiracy circles, there's a lot of jokes about they and them. Well, these are good theys and thems. Horrible grammar. These are good theys and thems. But we're going to come back to this concept of who they are. I I almost gave it away, but I stopped myself. Because this is really cool stuff. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Souls. And and that is the, the life force. It's... The, the term that's used there, and we can think of Revelation 6, 9 with the souls under the altar, the fifth seal, the souls under the altar, those who had been beheaded. Think of living in a time where your brothers in Christ are being beheaded, and you might be next. Put yourself in the text, and things come to life. They had been beheaded. Why? Drug dealing? Insurrection? Murder? No, for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, because they were living out Jesus ruling in their hearts through faith and ruling through the word and preaching and proclaiming the word. And they wouldn't shut up and they wouldn't say, no, I don't believe they wouldn't do what Roman captors would taunt them and tell them to do to just look at the other believers. This is what happened to Polycarp, the church father who was told as they tied him to the wood and a stake. Just look over there at those Christians who also were going to die and say, heathens, unbelievers, and we'll spare you. And he looked at the Roman crowd in the audience in the Colosseum and said, heathens, and they lit the flames. For their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Simple and, 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 and had the beast come? Was there a mark of the beast as we think of it as something that's yet to come? Or is simply the mark of the beast giving in to the system and allowing them to control you, to say to, about other believers, even to denounce your faith? That is also the mark of the beast. It will, in the very end, have a more full manifestation, we are led to believe. But He's not talking about something in the future. He's talking about what he saw then and there. And what did they do? He just said they were beheaded. They were beheaded. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, riddle me this. How can those who were beheaded in John's day rule with Christ for a thousand years if that's something that we're still waiting for? Don't wait for the thousand years. It's here. Enjoy it. Understand it. Appreciate your role in it, your moment in history. Everybody wants a moment in history. Everybody wants to think that they can be significant, that they matter, that you are and you do. I'll share this. I just found out that a guy I've been trying to reconnect with for 35 years, the first person I ever with whom I ever shared the gospel, and it was a pitiful attempt. You can trust me. I've been praying for him for 35 years. We connected last week. You know what he's doing? He's doing prison ministry. He's preaching the gospel and sharing his faith. We are in this awesome moment of history. Appreciate it for what it is, and it changes how you look at everything. You, they, it says, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Here's a thought. You think of the dead who were gone, the loved ones that you miss, and we do. We're separated from them. We cry. Jesus cried when Lazarus died. But they're living and reigning with Christ. On further down, it says that they're priests. So let that change the way you look at it. And what does living and reigning with Christ in paradise mean? I don't know. But I like to think about it. I I like to imagine what it might be. You notice there are no harps and clouds mentioned here. 
no heavenly repose. No, <clears throat> they are living and reigning with Christ throughout his kingdom, which is the thousand years that began when he rose and ascended into heaven and lasts until the day he comes back. What did the angel say to the disciples on the day of ascension? Don't stand looking up into heaven, into the clouds. He who you saw go up into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, verse 5, grammatical challenges here, and you're going to have to uh, forgive me because I got to go into a, a little bit of Greek grammar here. But the rest of the dead did not live. And you see what I did with again. I put a line through it and some slashes over it. It was like a slash from Wolverine, right? Three claws. The rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. These dead, these, it's not just talking about those who are physically dead. We talked about the three kinds of death, three categories of death. It's talking about those who are spiritually dead. They don't live. And the again isn't there. The word until, it is the Greek preposition akri. Akri, up until through a given period of time. And, and it doesn't say that they live again. That, that's a different word than what this is. This word is simply, I'll show it to you. This word, this is the rest of the dead. Poi loi poi ton necron, necrosis. You know that word. Uk is not edzeson. That's from zao, the word to live. Like zoology, it, it's not the word for being resuscitated, brought back to life, being resuscitated, whatever it might be. And there's that uh, Cree until tell us thy the end of the thousand years. It's not that they're going to be raised then. This is saying that the dead stay dead. The dead stay dead. They never have spiritual life. And that goes all the way through the thousand years. Now, this until part, up until and through this period of time, it doesn't mean that they're going to live after that period of time. That's not grammatically what this states. It simply means all this period of time, they never live. It says nothing about what happens if after. It says that they're judged and thrown into a lake of fire is what comes after that, the second death that is mentioned down here. Damnation. It's like saying, I didn't get paid for... 10 years up until the time I was 60, I didn't get paid. That doesn't, that statement grammatically does not mean that I got paid when I turned 60. It, it doesn't say that. It just says that period of time didn't get paid up until then. Through that period of time, I didn't get paid. If there's more to be said about it afterwards, it would say it. But the rest of the dead, they stay dead is what it's saying. This is the first resurrection. Are you ready to have your minds blown? Because here we go. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. Now, here's the thing. And this is, I think, the most awesome part of this. We're going back into the three kinds of life and, and three kinds of death here. This is saying that all this stuff about living and reigning with Christ that applies to the people in Philadelphia and Thyatira, all those Sardis, all those cities, it applies to us as well. Because what is the first resurrection? Well, spiritual life. What did Jesus say? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. This is talking about this amazing thing that we come to life and also you died and your life is hidden in Christ with God. Who you really are, what you're really about isn't defined by what you see. There's something going on that you cannot see. And for that, we need to go look at a video I did that when I did it, some of you might have thought I was out of my gourd, The Lamb and the 144,000. And the title of this video was, it's over here, appearing beneath me, there but not yet. 
Because here in this comforting section, I'm not going to go through the whole thing about the 144,000. It speaks of it as being believers who were on earth at this time, that they're part of the celebrating, as is shown with this picture over here, the celebrating in heaven. And I'll give you the specific on that. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. Uh, Let me find the right one. The ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. It's talking about living your faith wherever the lamb leads. That's where we're going to go. And it includes them in the group that is in heaven. Are you in heaven? Well, that's an interesting question. Are you in heaven? Your life is hidden with whom? Let's let's go back to that. For you died. You died. To this world, you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's some next-level stuff going on here. Ephesians 2, 6. In that wonderful section, go read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I don't have time. Go read that section. In the midst of telling us we were spiritually dead, now we're brought to life by grace through faith, Paul says this, and raised us up together, and did what? And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in the heavenly realms, in the heavenly matters. Now, we want to take that and water it down. That's, that's for the most part, in translation, what we do in applying it. We take it and say, yeah, yeah, we're in a better spiritual situation. It's not what it says. And it's not what Colossians 3, which interestingly is the sister epistle to Ephesians, he wrote them at the same time and it covers most of the same material. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. We're seated with him in the heavenly places. And then in case we missed it, he tells us in Colossians 3.20, Paul says it this way, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await, eagerly wait for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what I am saying is that this first resurrection, us coming to faith, being brought to faith through the gospel, puts us in an amazing status where, yes, we're here, and I cannot see myself as being there with the heavenly legion singing Christ's praise, but that is the reality. What a change that makes to how I look at my mundane, humdrum, trying to make a living existence. I'm way more than that. You are way more than that. This is awesome. And that's why he says, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. There is this spiritual transcendence to our reality. And I'll I'll share this with you. This is all new to me. I've been working on it, thinking about it since I did this video back on Revelation 14. That's been a while. But I think that the scriptural teaching, what it sets forth, makes this inescapable. We are now, though we cannot see it or comprehend it, just like I can't see or comprehend eternity, we are part of it, and we are there in a way, in a real way, but a way that I cannot comprehend or fathom. Elsewise, why would the Apostle Paul tell us this? And if being a part of this, being there, Where we're on those thrones, we become part of the divine council. Where we're on those thrones and judgments committed and and all of those things, then why would John here in Revelation define that as being tied to the first resurrection? The first resurrection, that spiritual resurrection. This is amazing. Amazing stuff. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests. That is added to living and reigning. Priests. What do priests do? Priests have direct access to God. I read one theologian, a commentator, who talked about the people in heaven praying on our behalf. They're priests. What do priests do? They lift up prayers on behalf of the people. 
Maybe that's part of what they do, but that is combined with combined with living and reigning. Over what do they reign? Well, maybe that's a spiritual warfare thing. I don't know. Maybe they are participating in spiritual warfare now. I don't know, but it says they live and reign, and I don't think that's just sitting around waiting for it all to end. They will be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. If the thousand years is the era of church history where it's Christ ruling in our hearts through his word, if that's the kingdom of God, then why wouldn't it be that we are, why wouldn't it be that we're not a part of this? It wouldn't make any sense. Well, there's a whole lot here. This is, and it's only four verses. It's only four verses. That's why I say study, dig in, go deep. I'll recommend this. Go back and watch that video. Watch some of the other videos I've done on Revelation. You know what? You know what I did this week? Twice I listened to that video. I listened to a couple other videos as well of my own videos. We need to be in the Word. We need to study so that in this spiritual warfare, when we put on the full armor of God, I need to understand. If I'm putting on armor, you can hand me a bunch of weaponry. If I don't understand it, what good is it going to do? Might make me look cool. Might make me look like I'm ready to be in an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or something like that. But if I don't know how to use it, it's not going to do any good. As we put on the full armor of God, so that having done all we will, in that evil day, we will be able to stand. I need to know how the armor works. And we know how the armor works by study, getting deep into it. A soldier doesn't learn how to shoot his M4 carbine and then put it away and never practice again. A pilot doesn't learn how to fly and quit flying because, well, I already know how to do that. No, we need refresher. We need to go deeper. And here's the thing about the Word of God. It's the only book that you can study all your life even if you were able to do it all day, and never master it. It is different. It is profound. It is special. And and I'm glad that you're here studying along with me. I hope that this is a blessing to you. I hope it makes you think. I hope that it takes you deeper into the Word. This is Matthias 76 together. We are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.